We'll read, please, from 2 Kings and chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse number 14. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. And Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou have consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed, three times and stopped. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. And hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. It came to pass, as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulchre of Elisha. But when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. But Haziel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. And the Lord was gracious unto them and had compassion on them and had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not destroy them. Neither cast he them from his presence as yet. So Haziel, king of Syria, died. And Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his stead. And Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father by war. Three times did Joash beat him and recovered the cities of Israel. What an intriguing and interesting passage that we have before us this evening. Uh, there was a reasonable amount in the commentaries that I was looking at, but when I looked up on the, the different sites and so on that I do to listen to some messages on the passage, I found that there was not very many at all. So that always makes it interesting when uh, perhaps there aren't too many messages around. And uh, I just want to think with you regarding the passage in four ways this evening. We're going to think of the background and then we think of the bow. Uh, that's in verses 14 to 19. And then we'll think of the bones in verses 20 and 21. And then we'll think of the battles that are mentioned in the balance of the chapter in verses 22 to 25. So background, bow, bones and battles. And in terms of one or two sentences that overall would summarise practically what I want us to really take away from the passage this evening, it would be this that our faithfulness includes making the best of what is entrusted to us. But God's faithfulness to his word is perfect. We're going to see particularly in regard to, uh, with the section about the bow, that God expects us to make good use of the opportunities that he gives to us. But in the remainder of the chapter, we're going to see that God will work. And God is faithful to his word and keeps his word, irrespective of the spiritual condition of his people. Well, let's get straight into it then and think about something of the background of the passage that's before us. If you're reading through Second Kings, uh, you perhaps get to this section and think, oh yes, Elisha, been a little while since we heard about him back in chapter 9. And in fact, in terms of Israel's history, it would have been, it would have seemed even longer somewhere between perhaps 40 and 50 years have elapsed since we're told anything so far as the divine record is concerned about Elisha. But you know, despite that time that has elapsed, 
and the lack of spiritual progress and change that there has been in the nation. Elisha here has not lost his zeal nor his power. We see somebody who is keen on the Lord's people achieving victories. And also, too, we see that there in the grave, God is still working through his servant. And there can come periods like this in our lives, can't there, where uh, maybe even we may even see what's happened over the last few months as being a bit like that, perhaps for some, that it has been a time when things have been different, where perhaps it hasn't been what we would have envisaged or we might have liked. And yet we see that Elisha, he is in many ways undiminished by what has taken place in these quiet years. And at the end of it, there's no cynicism detectable. There's no sense of, well, I just give up. Uh, no sense of, well, I'm coming towards the end, so that's that. Now here's somebody whose spiritual zeal and power endures, despite the intervening years where we haven't heard very much about him. Just one other thing by way of background, uh, I'm not going to spend much time on it because it's, it's complicated, but just to, just to mention it in passing, had we read the previous section uh, of the chapter, we would have concluded in verse number 13 that Joash slept with his fathers and Joash was buried in Samaria. And that might have caused us to scratch our heads a bit. And we might also have scratched our heads with what we read in verse number 25 there about Jehoash, and then it's talking about Joash. And uh, it all gets a bit complicated to unravel. Let me just try and make it as simple as I can. It would appear that both the king of Samaria, or the king of Israel, up there in the north, you remember the capital city was Samaria, and the king of the south, Judah, with the capital of Jerusalem, were both called Joash uh, for at least some of this time. And so sometimes, one of them is called Jehoahash, and yet it isn't done consistently. And you do have to really figure out which of the two you're talking about. It's made clearer by the fact that if it's talking about the one from the north, it will talk about the king of Samaria or the king of Israel. And if it's talking about the one in the south, then it will talk about the king of uh, Judah or the king of Jerusalem and so on. There's also a complicating factor in, the, in, in reading the chapter that verses 10 to 13 are really a summary of the king of Israel's life. It concludes with his death. But as happens a number of times with scripture, you get a summary statement and then the scriptures go back and give more detail that elaborates on it. And so that explains why having spoken about Joash's death in Samaria, we then get Joash, the king of Israel, doing certain things in verse number 14. The scriptures are going back and filling in some details of what happens in his life. So I'm not going to say any more about it, but just um, if you want the, the notes, um, they're, they're available. And uh, the, the, um, it's just useful just to have that in mind. The fact of these two kings uh, having the same name uh, and also therefore being known by a secondary name as well. And this idea of doing a summary of the life and then going back and giving more detail regarding it. So I think that's enough in regard to background. Let's go on and think about verses 14 to 19 and think about something of the bow. Verse number 14, as Elisha is now dying, Joash, and we'll just call him Joash uh, for the sake of simplicity, decides that he will come and visit. Somewhat unusual. Plenty of times prophets visit kings. However, this is somewhat unusual for a king to visit a prophet. And it might just be that this is too little too late, really, in terms of his attitude. He's not a particularly godly king at all. We know that all the kings in the north were, 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 were wicked. There wasn't a good one among them. And Joash, he comes and he realizes that the impending death of Elisha will be for the detriment of the nation. However, he hasn't got the spiritual desire, really, to see through victory over the enemy. And that can be so true, can't it? I mean, we shouldn't leave it too long uh, until people are dying before we go and say complimentary things to them or, 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 or wish that they were staying a bit longer. Uh, nor too should we leave it until they're dying before we have the resilience and the zeal to take on the work 
of those that are leaving earth for, for glory and we would have we should seek to have the resilience and the determination that older saints have shown that there would be a continuation of good spiritual influence now it's interesting in the expression that he uses oh my father my father the chariot of israel and the horsemen thereof of course it sounds familiar and that's because it's the same expression that was used by elisha when elijah was taken from him i think the idea behind the expression the chariot of israel the horsemen thereof is that the power the influence the help that elisha was for the nation was the equivalent of having a vast army that would perhaps be the thought behind the expression what particularly appealed to me was that elisha here at the conclusion of his life on earth is described in the same way as having the same character as the ascended man that he has followed and isn't that a good thing for us to be striving after that when it comes to the end of our days people would use the description the words that they would have used of the savior to describe us the ascended man that we are seeking to follow now it's interesting in verse number 16 that elisha says to him take bow and arrows and he has before him the the desire that there would be great victory over over the um over over the enemy over the syrians there's no sense with elisha here as he gets to uh, you know advanced age of saying well you know there's no point in going out to battle don't you be trying anything adventurous for god uh, no no you don't want to be you know i've seen what's happened in the past no here is somebody who in his older years has got great vision about the potential of what can be achieved with god's help i remember one time when i, I took over a team and uh, i was uh, getting to know them at work and uh, you know they went round and introduced themselves and uh, there was an old boy he said uh, steve there's two things you need to know about me number one i'm the oldest in the team and number two i'm the team cynic and i don't think that there's any place for that amongst the people of god titus chapter 2 speaks about those that are aged being strong in faith it should be that the older we get in the christian experience almost the more daring that we would be in the exploits we would do for god for having proved him and seen his faithfulness and seen his goodness and seen how he keeps his promises there would be a willingness to really step out and see the potential rather than just the problems in seeking to live for god and here is somebody who even though perhaps he can't do as much as he used to be able to do he's willing to do what he can do you see he didn't say to the king well you get on and shoot the arrow no he put his hand with him he did what he could do in terms of uh helping in the work in verse number 19 I, i'm interested to see that still in his old age he is described as the man of god we've noticed a number of times haven't we as we've been going through this tremendous description elisha described using that expression more than anyone else in scripture the man of god and isn't it wonderful this wasn't just something to do with him being young or middle-aged but even here in old age he keeps that description he has stayed wonderfully consistent throughout his life now in shooting in verse number 17 eastward it's quite clear that this is towards Syria and he is making it clear that the picture being given to the king is that there is power to achieve victory there is no question at all in terms of the way that Elisha explains it in verse number 17 it is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance the deliverance over Syria now I, I trust that you won't think i'm trying to make a point that isn't there uh, but it is just very interesting in terms of thinking about the potential for victory that the believer has in their life what is it that makes that wonderfully possible well if you think about arrows uh, and, and if i might just take those as a picture of prayer that which shoots through the air uh, in acknowledgement of our dependence upon god that would remind us of the priestly the high priestly work of the lord jesus as he intercedes for us and supplies that which we need 
there is the priestly work of the Lord Jesus in the arrows. We are also reminded of a prophet in Elisha, and we are reminded of a king in Joash. And we see the three working together as Elisha and Joash fire the arrows together. And I trust that you um, would excuse me if you think I'm not just stretching the bow, but stretching the Bible. But I do just think that there is a lovely little picture of the potential victory that the believer has because of the high priestly work of Christ, because of the word of God on which we depend. Uh, he is the prophet and because he is king, the one who is triumphant, the one who is over all. Well, anyway, it's certainly the case that in the shooting of the arrow, there is the reminder to the king that God is able to give uh, victory. He is able to give triumph. But then in verse number 19, Elisha is angry with him because he does not avail himself fully of the potential that there is. Having explained to him that these arrows are to do with the, the, the victory that God wants to give, he only does it three times instead of the five or six that he could have done. And I take it that this brings before us the key uh, practical lesson that there is in the passage for us. That God is vitally interested, not just in what we have done, but in what we could have done. There is a spiritual complacency in being content with partial victories. I wonder are there times in our Christian experience, I know there certainly would be in mine, where we perhaps excuse a failure to be triumphant over sin or in some other circumstance by saying, well, on such and such a day, it went all right. Yes, there were these days when it didn't just go so well, but well, I'm not doing too bad. And this mediocrity that would be pictured here is not really pleasing to the Lord. The Lord wants us to have continual victories in our Christian experience. We know that that just doesn't happen because of our imperfections, but that's his desire. That's what he has made available. And we mustn't get carried away by mediocrity, by the times when it has gone well. Um, and perhaps there are many a time when it hasn't. I just want to widen the point out that the Lord is concerned, not just with sins of commission, where we do things that are wrong, but also with the sins of omission, where we fail to do for the glory of God what we could have done. And I take it that while we very easily and perhaps very readily will see sins of commission in our lives and in the lives of others, we're perhaps less uh, aware and less willing to acknowledge the sins of omission, where we could have done more for the Lord and we didn't. Is it a lack of vision, a lack of faith, a lack of desire? I want to think for a moment with you about time, about talents, about technology and about treasure. Uh, and in terms of why I'm thinking about this particularly, in the New Testament context of stewardship, we think about that which has been given to us, that which has been entrusted to us. And the Lord is not interested in just whether we've done a little bit for him, but whether we have fully used that which he has entrusted for us. If you think about the parable of the talents for a moment, you think about the person that was entrusted with five, how easily they could have said, well, you know what, huh, I, I, I've managed to make three. That's more than the person with two. And yet three wasn't enough. Because God, having given five, he expected five in return. Now, for the person that God had only given two to, well, that was, only, that was okay to only have a return of two. But how important it is in the context of stewardship that we're making good use of the time that God has given to us. As is so often said, it's not so much about counting the days, but making the days count. We don't know, do we, how long we've got given to us. Let's be seeking to use the time that God has given for him. Think about the talents that God has given to us. Think about the spiritual gifts and also the wider abilities that God has given. I remember sharing with, with a, a friend a particular interest that we had in, the, uh, in a particular aspect of the work of God that we, we were wondering about whether we should branch out and, and start doing. And he gave some very wise advice. He said, Steve, 
Your primary gift is X. Focus on that and don't get distracted into other things, good though they may be. And that's good advice, to be very aware of the gifts that the Lord has given to us and get on and use them to the maximum that we can. What of technology? The use, the potential that that has to be used in the spread of the gospel. Yes, we're very aware, aren't we, of the dangers. But whether it's our car, whether it's the internet, whether it's the computers, whatever the technology is that we're thinking about, God has entrusted it to us. We live in a day and a generation that has uh, so many good things, so many amazing things. We need to use it well for the gospel, don't we? I remember Harvey uh, some time ago having dug through the uh, question box in the Believers magazine from many years ago, showing me uh, a question where it was asked, should Christians be more aware of the dangers of the wireless and be very careful about its use? And the very wise answer that came back went to the, the effect of something like this. Yes, Christians should be aware of the dangers, but they should be very aware too of the potential of the wireless to be used in the spread of the gospel. What a good balanced answer that is that stands the test of time. And we don't know what the technology will be in 10 years time, but I'm sure there'll be dangers in it. But I'm sure too there'll be potential in it to be used for the glory of God, for the spread of the gospel and for the help of the Lord's people. What of our treasure? our money uh, and our other possessions that we have. We have them on trust, don't we? Are we looking to maximize the return for God and use them well? The overall principle that I take from uh, what happened here with Elisha is, yes, it's particularly in the context of achieving the spiritual victory. But I think there is the wider lesson too of using well what God has entrusted to us. Uh, to give some New Testament verses in terms of time. Remember Ephesians 5 verse 16, redeeming the time, I might quote the NIV, making the most of every opportunity. To quote Phillips, make the best use of your time. We've made reference already to the parable of the talents. Think of the words of the Lord Jesus in Luke 8, to whom much is given, much is required. And we've been speaking about stewardship and one of the passages that would make mention of that is 1 Corinthians chapter four, to use well that which God has entrusted and committed to us. So we thought the background, we thought of the bow, let's think about the bones. Verse number 21, I don't know what these people made of it when suddenly having put somebody, you know, they sort of throw, throw the body in and back it comes. And uh, I think they probably had more reason to be frightened of that than they did of the Moabites that were coming. You know, slight humor aside, the lesson that immediately strikes me from verse number uh, 21 is that the enemy kept on coming. We think about the way in the previous section we had the way that three arrows was not going to be enough. And here Elisha is dead and buried and the enemy is busy. And we're reminded, aren't we, in Ephesians chapter 6 of the continual nature of our warfare. We think about the expressions that Paul uses there, put on the whole armor of God, not enough to put on a little bit, so that you can stand, and having done all to stand, and praying always, then at the end of the little description in verse number 18, we see the incessant way that the enemy keeps coming, and the enemy keeps coming. Until we get to glory, the Christian will never be finished with the battle. Uh, we had VJ Day, didn't we, uh, during, during the past few days. There is no surrender by the enemy that we face. There is no amnesties and the believer is in the continual battlefield until they go home to glory. Well speaking of going home to glory, uh, Elisha died and we see that although the servant had gone, the power remained. And I take it that that's because it never was Elisha's power anyway. It was of course God's power. And what an encouragement this would have been to uh, the Lord's people, the Israelites, reading this uh, book many uh, years later in the captivity that subsequently took place, to realize that although good servants of God had passed on, God's power was still available. There still would be a future for the nation. Ezekiel 37, in that great passage, 
probably one of the few passages of Ezekiel, perhaps we are fairly familiar with, the valley of the dry bones and the new life that came. Romans 11 would speak about uh, the idea too of life coming to the, the nation, despite the fact that they might look dead. There is a future for the nation of Israel, and what an encouragement it would have been for those in captivity in a past day, and an encouragement it will be for those in the future, that even though the nation may look dead, God is not finished with them at all. It's a well-known expression, and Colin Lacey has it in his What the Bible Teaches commentary, but I don't think it was originally his necessarily. The Lord buries his workmen, but carries on his work. And we must never think, must we, that God's work is dependent upon individuals. God is able to take them either to another scene or to another sphere or, or take them home to glory. And the Lord is well able to keep going his work because it is his work. It is interesting to compare the end of Elijah and Elisha's life on earth. In Elisha, there is life given to one who is dead. And in Elijah, there was the taking up of one who was alive. And I trust that your mind has immediately jumped to 1 Thessalonians and chapter 4. We think about how for the believer, there will be those who are caught up alive when the Lord Jesus returns to take them to be with him in glory. And there are those in the grave who will be taken up uh, and given life and taken home to glory. We have, very interestingly, the two brought before us. You might say, well, Steve, 1 Thessalonians 4, it's the other way round, isn't it? The way that it's brought before us. I take it, if I might put it in this way, that we live our lives looking for an Elijah departure and willing to serve on in case it is an Elisha departure. And perhaps the order is just given to us for that reason. We live our lives looking for the coming again of the Lord Jesus, that we might be uh, translated, taken alive, to be to the glory. But you know, we might just have to live on, and it might yet be many years before the Lord Jesus returns, and yet we have the assurance that if we die, then the Lord is still able to raise us and take us to be with him when he comes. Now, just before we leave the bones, one uh, thing that uh, I think is very interesting practically for us is I, I wonder whether we see the potential for us to give new life to people when we have left this scene of time. You say, Steve, I don't think these sorts of miracles take place today. Uh, we live opposite the cemetery uh, here in Datchet, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to be too worried that if we go in and put things in the ground that suddenly they're going to come back alive at us or anything like that. But I do think absolutely it is possible in a spiritual sense for this to be absolutely true. That sometimes God takes up what people have done in their lifetime in spreading the gospel and in teaching the word of God and uses it more after they've gone home to glory than he ever does during their lifetime. And indeed, somebody has said this uh, in a commentary by Butler. I found it quoting somebody called Ellis. Our posthumous influence does not receive enough of our thought. To think about the legacy that we are leaving behind. It might be in terms of the words that are left on the gravestone. Uh, one of the things that we did during lockdown, and I've been wanting to do for years, was to walk around the cemetery that is opposite our house and take pictures of the gravestones that are clearly those of those that were believers down here upon earth. And you see the tremendous triumphant change as you walk around the, the cemetery, you know, forever with the Lord, you know, with Christ, which is far better, and, and many other great expressions that are there. And uh, that's one way, of course, that can be done. But what about all the seed that is planted during our lifetime? It was said concerning Abel, he being dead yet speaks, and there is wonderful potential to be a bringer of life-transforming good news into the lives of people even long after we've gone home to glory if we are planting it well during our lifetime. May we be encouraged to spread the gospel and it might just be that even if we don't see it here and now that the Lord will be pleased to use it even once we've gone home to glory. You know without pushing it too far even when we think of the Lord Jesus so much more has been achieved after his death for the blessing of mankind than was achieved before the cross. We follow a good example in making that point, I think. Then finally, let's come to the battles. Why have I included this little section 
here at the end. It was particularly uh, the verse in number 25 that particularly caught my eye uh, initially. Three times did Joash beat him, the king of Syria. Isn't it interesting? God kept his word regarding these three victories that were accomplished. Joash, you have been a disappointment. Elisha has been cross with you for your failure to achieve what you could have done. And yet God is faithful. God promised that there would be these victories. And so three there were. And isn't it wonderful that though there isn't as much faithfulness and spirituality from the king or from the nation as there should have been, we see that God keeps his word. As we come towards the end of Elisha's life, and indeed as we look back even on the life of Elijah as well, how tempted we could be to say, well, really, was it worth it? What was achieved in terms of transforming the nation for God? They're going to go into captivity in the not too distant future. It doesn't appear that there has been great transformational change in the spiritual caliber of the nation as a whole. But of course, that wasn't the primary reason why Elisha lived as a man of God. It wasn't because of the world change that he accomplished, much as he might have liked to have done that and much as we might like to achieve that. But it was in response to a God who is faithful and always keeps his word. We have a God who is utterly faithful, whose word can be relied upon, whose promises are totally true. And that's the motive for service, isn't it? That's the motive for living for him. Yes, we trust and we believe in the potential of the gospel and the teaching of the word of God to transform lives. And yet we know that so often in the service of God, there will be that which appears humanly disappointing. If that's our only motive, we're bound to be disappointed at times. But we do it primarily, don't we, in response to a God who calls, who commissions and who keeps his wonderful word. You know, we've mentioned about the comparisons between Elijah and Elisha. Just to conclude with this, they were different, weren't they? There are some similarities in their lives, and yet there are also differences. And particularly here at the conclusion, as we see the different ways in which their time on earth ended, we see that God treats his servants differently sometimes. And particularly when it comes to, to death and suffering and so on, God has different plans for different ones of his servants and our responsibility is of course to get on and just do what the Lord wants us to do uh, and not worry too much about um, God's leading for others in in this context uh, we think about the Lord's words to uh, Peter regarding John in John 21 in that regard what is that to thee follow thou me God has different circumstances for different ones of his servants and so it is for us today. We have different circumstances and different experiences, different context to both Elisha and Elijah, and yet we have the same God who is worth living for. Here was God who in a scene of death with Elisha's bones, and a man forsaken with the one who was thrown in, and with the enemy attacking, God brought new life. He did that in Elisha's day. He did that at the tomb of the Lord Jesus when the Lord Jesus had died and he'd been forsaken and the enemy attacked. God brought new life and in his great power, he is able to bring new life through his word today. What potential there is for us to seek to live for God in the power of a risen Christ, seeking to make known a powerful gospel. And the challenge to us is this, isn't it? To what extent are we living in the good of the potential that God has made available to us? We trust that God will bless his word to us this evening.